That Triathlon Show 189. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I talk about 10 ways to improve your training and triathlon performance. And these are 10 things that I've noticed that I often end up talking about with my coaching clients, and also I use them myself in my training to make sure that my training is effective. And just briefly to give you an idea, these are the 10 things. One, knowing the purpose of each workout. Two, having the right mindset and taking the right mindset into each day and into each workout. Three, the prerequisites of a successful workout. Four, using session RPE to train at the right intensity. Five, focusing on the big picture. Six, the theory of constraints and the engine and the chassis. Seven, getting out of your comfort zone, but not just by going harder. Eight, using group training strategically. Nine, benefiting from the compound effect of coaching, testing, and technical advice. And ten, reviewing your training and racing. A quick house cleaning item, as I mentioned a couple of episodes before, Scientific Triathlon now has an Instagram account, and uh, we're trying to be quite active there and uh, giving out some good content and uh, videos and uh, and things like that. So uh, check it out. It's at Scientific Triathlon HQ. If you're on Instagram, give us a follow, and I hope that you'll enjoy uh, the content there. Now, thank you to our sponsors, Precision Hydration. There's still some time to send in hydration questions for my interview with Andy Blow, or I guess not interview, but uh, hydration Q&A that we'll have with expert guest Andy Blow, founder of Precision Hydration. Uh, So send in those questions. Some of you have already done so, which is brilliant. So we have a list, but there's still time to get your question answered. Uh, Of course, in the meantime, summer is here in the Northern Hemisphere. So make sure that you have your hydration strategy clear for your training and racing. The best way to go about doing this is to go to precisionhydration.com and take their free online sweat test to get your personalized hydration strategy. And you can get your first box of electrolyte product for free with the promo code that's triathlon show all one word all caps and a big thank you to roca that you can find on roca.com they are the world leaders in wetsuits tri suits swim skins and high performance eyewear among other things and uh, you can see their gear on top athletes like javier gomez mario mola katie Safiris, flora duffy and many many others so it's really really top of class check them out on roca.com and get 20% off your entire order with the promo code TTS all caps. All right, let's get into this uh, episode. And uh, yeah, not, not an interview today. It's uh, it's just an episode. So number one, know the purpose of each workout. I know that this may seem like uh, a boring and uh, perhaps a fluffy point to bring up, but If you think it is, then you are probably just a person that has to listen to this. And the reason that I, without hesitation, put this at the top of the list is that in my experience, 90% of self-coached athletes just don't don't know what they're trying to achieve with each workout. And because of this, the likelihood of, of executing the workout incorrectly, it really goes through the roof. So each workout that you do should have a purpose in at least one, but possibly several of the following categories. One, metabolic. So this is what quote unquote energy system are you targeting and what level of stress are you applying? Also, we include in this category, the metabolic category, what nutritional state are you training in and what nutrition and hydration are you taking on board during that training? Uh, Two, the musculoskeletal uh, category. And this uh, refers to what level of stress are you applying on the musculoskeletal system and where and why specifically and can you handle that level of stress? Uh, Three is uh, the technical category. So are you working on particular technical aspects, technical purposes? Are you using particular equipment setups and so on? And uh, purpose four or purpose category four is the environmental category. 
This could almost be seen as a mixture of the metabolic, musculoskeletal, and technical, uh, but uh, I let it stand on its own. So this includes, for example, uh, are you doing your swimming in the open water or in the pool? Are you doing your bike and run training, climbing and descending hills or on the flats? Are you training in hot or humid temperatures or maybe even doing some sort of heat acclimation protocol indoors? Are you training at altitude, etc.? And uh, the fifth purpose category is recovery. And uh, this includes factors as, is this an active recovery session or is it a complete rest day? So that complete rest day, of course, should also have a purpose and that should be a complete passive recovery day. But uh, why do you think that uh, whatever you choose, whether it's active or passive recovery, is the better option of the two? So these are the things that you need to consider. So five categories, just to repeat them quickly, metabolic, musculoskeletal, technical, environmental, and recovery. And you need to know what the purpose of each day or each workout is. And as I said, it may have purposes in one or several of these categories. So when you know what the purpose of each workout is and you answer that question to yourself before you go out and do that workout, this will help you stay on track. It will help you stay present and execute the workout according to that intended purpose. So for example, if you have a a technical focus, then your mind should not be drifting. You should be very present and focused on whatever that technical purpose is. If on the other hand, you are targeting a certain intensity zone, and you know why you are targeting that zone, this will stop you from diverting from your plan and uh, doing it too hard or too easy. You'll stick to that zone that you planned because you know that the purpose of the workout is to stay in that zone. So it makes no sense to go either harder or easier than what you planned. And as a final point on uh, knowing the purpose of each workout, always remember that you're looking for maximum adaptation and maximum results The point is not to try to maximize training stress or maximize the input you put into each workout. It's to maximize the output, what you get out from the workout in the form of adaptation and improved performance. So there you go. That's number one. Let's get into number two, which is mindset. Not all hours of training are created equal. And this is actually one of the things that I believe sets professional uh, professional athletes apart from amateur athletes, much more than their genetics or whatever. The, The thing that I think sets them apart more than that is that they get more out of each hour of training that they put in by having a great mindset, a great attitude about each workout and each hour of training and not necessarily just workout related, but, but everything that they do that relates to their triathlon performance. Uh, specifically here i'm talking mostly about the workouts because otherwise we could talk for hours but what do i mean by having a good mindset going into a workout the first and uh, and primary thing really to consider is to be positive we do this sport because we, we love doing it and this applies of course also for the cyclists and runners and swimmers listening or other endurance athletes uh, no matter what our sport is we do it because we we love doing it nobody is making us do it it is an amazing gift to to get to go out and swim, bike and run, considering how many people don't have that opportunity. Also, most of us have been injured at some point and, uh, and know how miserable it was at that point to not get to go out and train. So the least we can do when we approach each workout is uh, to approach it with positivity and uh, be grateful that we get to do it. Because as I said, we get to do it. We choose to do it. We don't have to do it. If you consistently struggle adapting adapting a positive mindset, then there are two likely reasons for it the way I see it. And one possible reason is that you, you really need to work on your mental skills. It may just be uh, that you're, you're lacking self-confidence or something like that. And this causes you to feel negative about the workout, even though deep down you do want to do it and you do enjoy doing it. But that lack of self-confidence, feeling that you're maybe not good enough, that's something that may cause you to to not approach the workouts with the positive mindset that you need to have to get the most out of it. The second option is uh, that you may be overdoing it, that uh, you're training too hard or too much. And uh, lack of motivation is actually, it, it has been studied a lot and it's one of the strongest markers for overreaching or overtraining. So if you find that you're getting negative about going out and train, you're not having the motivation, then that could be a sign that you're perhaps just 
taking on a bit more than than you can than you can handle. The second part of the mindset equation here is to see each workout as a clean slate. So, for example, if you've had a bad couple of workouts prior to this one, forget them. This is a fresh start and you're only looking to do your best in this workout and uh, whatever happened before doesn't really matter. See the workout as a stepping stone, not a test of your fitness because it's not. And it's not a race against yourself or against others. Again, remember that you're looking for maximum adaptation and not maximum stress or maximum input. Each workout should be seen as part of the process of building your fitness. So important there. It's the process of building your fitness. It's not the test of where your fitness is at. Some workouts you do will be great and some will be not so great. But uh, to be honest, I think that when we see workouts as not so great, and this in- I include myself very much in, in this category, it's something that we tell ourselves because we're a bit too hung up on comparing exactly all the workouts that we do and not really accepting or understanding how fitness fluctuates even on a daily basis. And this comes back to knowing the purpose of each workout, that if we know the purpose of that workout, then we should be happy with each and every workout, even if it's considerably worse in terms of the numbers that you see, as long as we executed the intended purpose on whatever categories we, we had, so metabolically, musculoskeletally, technically, and so on. So I want to be clear here that you do not need to beat your numbers from last week to nail that intended purpose today. You may be doing your bike workout at even 10 watts lower or whatever, and you're still getting exactly the benefit that you're expected to get from that workout. Uh, Fitness fluctuates and what you did before affects what you do today. So uh, don't be too hung up on those things and comparing. Just focus on executing the intended purpose purpose of the workout and then you should be happy with what you did finally the final piece of the mindset here is to make the most of the workout and the circumstances that you do the workout in so an example to explain what i mean if you're going for a low intensity endurance run make the most of that run by also focusing on running with good form so you can in addition to getting that metabolic purpose in you're also getting a technical purpose in Good form makes a big difference and elite runners spend a lot of time working specifically on their running form, but also they spend a lot of time thinking about their running form and being present uh, in each of their bread and butter runs, whether it's an easy long run or an easy recovery run. And if you have some circumstances around your workout that are less than ideal, it can often be weather. So let's say uh, you're going out for the run, but it's raining a lot. Well, then Take a positive attitude or at least not a negative attitude and consider that to be great training for your next race where it will rain. So you actually get an added environmental purpose to the workout. And most of us will race in the rain at some point. So we might as well be prepared for it and see this as an opportunity rather than a negative. And that's to wrap up the mindset, see things as opportunities and uh, with a positive mindset and uh, not do not take a negative approach into the workout. All right, number three on the list here is uh, knowing the prerequisites of uh, successful workouts. And there are many things that we could put on this list, to be honest, but but I want to keep things fairly simple and not uh, make this list too long. But a few prerequisites of successful workouts uh, that uh, that I see are uh, mobilization or mobility and uh, recovery status and uh, hydration status and energy and carbohydrate availability status. Uh, Those would be the the three or four points, depending on if you categorize hydration and energy separately, which you probably should, uh, I guess. So so four points there to to look at. First, the first one is probably the one that that most athletes uh, skip and get wrong, and it's mobilization. It's really, really important for swimming and running in particular, and the harder you go, the more important it becomes. It does not have to be much. Five minutes of mobilization will give you 80% of the benefits for 20% of the effort. This is one of several times in this episode that you'll hear me referring to this uh, Pareto principle, the 80-20 principle. Uh, but So those five minutes will give you so much for so little input. Uh, but you really need to do it if you want to get the most out of your, your swim and run. And in particular, if it's a hard swim and run, then 
you really, really, there's no option. It's it's not optional. It's uh, it's mandatory. Uh, so if you aren't doing it right now, then you need to go back and consider what is the purpose of your workout. And when you think about that, ignoring mobilization uh, before your main set or before your workout, it means that you're shortchanging the musculoskeletal and technical aspects of the workouts every single time you're ignoring that mobilization. So that's uh, one very important point that I wanted to raise here with what are the prerequisites of successful workouts. Number two, a recovery status. So we could talk for hours about this, of course, but just briefly, workouts do not make you stronger. They create a stress that your body will hopefully adapt to during your recovery. But if your recovery status going into a workout is poor, you have a poor recovery status to start with, perhaps due to a couple of nights of poor sleep, then that stress that you originally planned uh, from the workout, it may be just way too much for the body to adapt to as you're already a bit in a hole, so to say. So when we're talking about prerequisites for successful workouts, we're not talking just about the workout itself, which could still go well even with a couple of hours of, of bad sleep. Uh, so you could be in a state of poor recovery and have a, at the face of it, a good workout. But also you need to consider your ability to adapt to the workout. And if you had very limited sleep for two nights, then that's uh, that's a place when you should be aware that I'm probably not going to be able to adapt to this hard workout. So even if I could do it, it makes no sense to do it. So I'll just turn it into an easy workout and focus on sleep the next few nights. And uh, then moving on to hydration status and energy and carbohydrate availability. For shorter low intensity workouts, this is, uh, this isn't really a constraint or a prerequisite at all. But for longer or harder workouts, it can really make or break your workouts and the adaptations that you get from it. So in terms of hydration, if we start there, once you get somewhere past a 2% dehydration, and that's a 2% decrease in body weight, even though the exact point is a bit uh, contentious, but that's really not the point, your performance will start to suffer at some level of dehydration. And depending on what workout you're doing, the performance decline may cause you to not be able to execute on the intended purpose of the workout. So going back to that first point again of the intended purpose. The same thing can happen if you haven't eaten properly and you have low energy availability in general. And in particular, if you are low on carbohydrates and the intensity is high, that's when that can really cause you to not get as much out of the workout as you should. You cannot push as many watts or run as fast as you would otherwise have been able to do. For example, if you're doing a set of VO2 max intervals and you have poor hydration status or low carbohydrate availability, then you most likely will not get as much time accumulated close to your VO2 max, your maximum aerobic capacity, as if you had taken care of those things. And depending on the degree of performance decrement that you see compared to, I guess, the ideal situation then you may not even be executing on the intended purpose of the workout. So we have various degrees here of how much the decrement is. Uh, You might be completely missing the intended purpose, or you might still benefit from the workout and still hit the intended purpose, but you're just not hitting it as effectively as you could if you had taken care of your hydration status and your energy and carbohydrate availability status. So that's uh, the prerequisites of successful workouts. Moving on to number four, using session RPE, rating of perceived exertion, to train at the right intensity. So as you probably know, I'm a big fan of using training zones, so using heart rate, power, pace, to help athletes train at the right intensity. We talked about that many, many times on the podcast before. However, I think that to really get the most out of your training, you should also be able to perform any workout based on RPE and session RPE alone, and it should be almost as effective as if you had access to your heart rate, your power, your pace, etc. And the reason I want all my athletes to be able to use session RPE to guide intensity is that quite often an athlete's true fitness is no longer reflected in whatever their training zones are set at. Uh, This is a bit different with different with heart rate because with heart rate training zones uh, don't change as much so they might be fairly static although they can change. So uh, that's uh, that's one caveat. The other caveat is that heart rate 
is not really useful in your harder workouts and depending on how hard you go but when you go go above threshold in particular that's when and you do shorter intervals that's when heart rate really isn't isn't that much use anyway so so if you try to stick to a certain power or pace zone on the other hand that is applicable for also high intensity workouts those zones might no longer be current because your fitness might have improved and then you're just holding yourself back but the opposite thing can also happen let's say you've been off of training for a week due to illness or travel and you may end up pushing way too hard to get that intended purpose of the workout executed correctly as soon as you get back because you rigidly stick to your zones that at the end of the day are just one snapshot in time of your fitness so session rpe gets around all of this so it it forces you to use uh, to go at the right intensity on that given day in your given circumstances for that given workout so what is session rpe well it's typically uh, it it comes from uh, an article originally i think the original source of session rpe is uh, an article by carl foster uh, that's a, a scientific article a, a research paper called a new approach to monitoring exercise training uh, probably actually i stand corrected that i'm i'm assuming that there have been papers on this before but carl foster is known sort of as the guy that uh, that has started to make session rpe really well known and and much used in the field so uh, he uses a link to that article in the show notes if you want to go deeper uh, either way it's very simple it's a 10 point scale uh, you rate how hard the session was from zero to ten or I guess from 1 to 10, because 0 is rest. And uh, the scale that they use in, in Carl Foster's work is uh, the modified Borg scale. So 1 there would be very, very easy, 2 would be easy, 3 would be moderate, 4 would be somewhat hard, 5 would be hard, and 6 is also hard, but slightly harder, 7 is very hard, and 8 and 9 are also very hard, and 10 is maximal. Uh, just a note here, in training peaks, you are able to uh, to rate your session RPE on a 10-point scale. But uh, the verbal cues that they use, I think they have moderate right in the middle there, so at the 5. Uh, so it's slightly different. Uh, either you don't, it doesn't matter which version you choose. If you are using training peaks, I would just go with their scale. But then make sure that uh, the advice that I give you next, that you follow sort of the verbal descriptor, descriptors for what you should uh, do rather than the the numerical descriptors uh, so so you should do the same as what i describe next but based on the verbal descriptors that i use if that if that is clear and if it's not um uh, i hope it is re-listen to it and it should be so the simple advice for how to use session rpe is that first of all you have to review every workout and, and give your each workout a rating on that session rpe scale if you did an easy workout a workout that is supposed to be easy uh, so let's say an endurance run or endurance bike and it's not very long then it should be rated as easy so as a two on that borg scale that that i just told you about where two refers to easy that part is fairly straightforward of course if you go for a long bike ride even if the intensity is the same the power is the same then that bike ride may feel more difficult it may feel like a four like somewhat hard if you go for five hours so uh, so there is that duration of the workout to take into account as well. And that's totally fine because uh, a five-hour bike ride, usually it, it shouldn't feel easy. It, it will feel somewhat hard uh, at the end of it because it's just so long uh, unless you're just completely coasting all the way. But uh, that's that's not usually the case. Uh, the the, the part, part where it gets more difficult, I guess, is the hard workouts. And, and my advice here is, and this is something that I talked a lot about with many of my coaching clients is that i really believe that most of the hard workouts that you do should be on that very hard spectrum so a seven or an eight or a nine using that uh, that modified borg scale that that foster uses there are some exceptions and some of them is for example if you're a beginner and you're just getting started with interval training then you might not need to go very hard it might be somewhat hard or hard and you're just getting started gradually building into it completely fine Another exception is you're in taper, you're just doing some light uh, light interval training that will keep you sharp but aren't meant to build your fitness. That workout, even though the intensity may be high, the total duration of intensity is very low, so the workout shouldn't feel like a very hard workout. Uh, 
Uh, so there are probably a, a few other exceptions, but those are a couple that, that come to mind. Uh, but in addition to most of your normal bread and butter hard workouts having to be on that very hard spectrum, in my opinion, to be the most effective, I also think that you never or almost never should have a 10, a, a maximal workout where you just time trial, you raise yourself and you could not go harder. That's simply not necessarily necessary and you are probably in the realm of diminishing returns if you do those sorts of workouts. Uh, in other words, we come back to the Pareto principles, you are not getting 80% of the returns for 20% of the effort, but you're actually putting in all of the effort and getting very little additional return from that workout. And uh, one of the reasons that I say this is that uh, one of the main drawbacks, I, I guess, is that each time you do a maximal effort workout, a 10 out of 10 workout, I see it as a withdrawal from your go to the well account and your mental toughness account. And uh, you need those accounts to be topped up on race day when it really matters. And uh, on the other hand, the way that I look at this with, with this analogy of, of having accounts of going to the well or, or mental toughness, when you do those hard workouts in training, those or very hard workouts, I should say, those sevens, eights and nines, you deposit something into those accounts. You get used to going very hard, but you also leave something in the bank. You're, you're not having to make a withdrawal. Uh, and that's when you, what you do when you have a 10 out of 10, a maximal effort workout, you make a withdrawal. And if you do that in training, and you don't you have your account is empty on race day then you're not able to go to the well and go really really hard when it matters so i think that there is a clear correlation with too many withdrawals from that go to the well account in training leading to not being able to perform at your best on race day now a question that you may have about this session rpe is how hard is very hard but not maximal what is a seven eight or a nine and it can actually be quite difficult to distinguish uh, because very hard is, by the nature of it, very hard. So unless you really think about it, it may feel like a maximal effort because the, the, the line isn't very clearly distinguished. It's, it's just a, a spectrum and, and we're moving on a narrow part of that spectrum. So the way I like to teach how to rate session RPE is if you were at gunpoint in your hard workout and somebody told you that you either have to go just slightly harder or just slightly longer at the same speed or power, could you do that? And if you could, but you could not go a lot harder or a lot longer, then you are probably somewhere in that very hard range. And where exactly you are depends on how much harder or how much longer could you have gone. So let's take an example here. Let's say you're running a set of 10 times 400 meters on the track with one minute recovery. And you run the 400s in 75 seconds. If that effort felt very hard, but you think that you could have run... Uh, these 400s at let's say 73 seconds if your life really depended on it and you were at gunpoint then that workout probably was a seven it was very hard but two seconds faster per two 400 is actually quite a lot so so i would say that that is a seven if you think that you could have gone just one second faster if your life depended on it that might be an eight and if you genuinely, genuinely think that you could not have run any faster, but you might have been able to do one more repeat at that same intensity or, or even just 300 meters at that same uh, pace of 75 seconds per 400, then that might be a 9 out of 10. So that's uh, using session RPE to guide your intensity. And I guess to come back to the main point here, if you get a workout, let's say you get a, a workout like 10 times 400, and perhaps you have at some point set your training zones and even used something like the Jack Daniels tables or Macmillan running tables to get your exact pace that you should run those 400 set. Th those paces may be good, but maybe if you have improved your fitness, they're not quite current anymore. Also, again, remember the daily fluctuations, etc. Uh, all of these things that, that can have small impacts on how fast you're able to run that workout on the given day. These come into the account and the only thing that you have to remember is that if you do that workout, you have the 10 by 400 on the paper, you don't need to remember what pace you should run at or what speed you should run at. It's irrelevant. The, what is relevant is that you go out and do that workout because it is a hard workout. It is it's supposed to be like a VO2 max workout. You go and do it at a very hard intensity, but not quite maximal. So you, at the end of the day, can say that, yeah, that was a seven or that was an eight or that was a nine. And you look at your times and you see, okay, that's what I managed to do for a seven and an eight or a nine. 
if you do that time and time again, then your training is going to be effective. As long as the training plan that you have is effective, of course. But but let's say that you're getting your plan from a coach, then uh, you can trust your session RPE just as much as your training zones. Because when you are improving, hopefully you are improving, then that session RPE is going to be just as accurate or more accurate than the training zones you set two months ago. Number five is to focus on the big picture. And I talked about this a lot on the podcast, so hopefully you're quite familiar with this by now. The thing to remember here is that no single workout and no group of small workouts, uh, quote unquote key workouts, is going to move the needle for you. What is going to move the performance needle is the amount of adaptation to training stress that you can accumulate consistently over a long period of time. So uh, go go back 15 seconds in your podcast app and listen to that again uh, if you didn't get it, because that's uh, perhaps the most important sentence that uh, that you'll hear in this episode. With that in mind, trying to accumulate as much adaptation as possible or consistently over a long time, what are the greatest threats to not be able to do that? The greatest threats would be injury, illness, overtraining or over non-functional overreaching, lack of motivation, and inconsistency for other reasons. But you will note that all of those four first, what they lead to is inconsistency. And uh, I'll talk about actually a personal example here because I made two big mistakes this season where not focusing on the big picture uh, cost me by causing a run injury. So actually it's a single run injury, but I made two mistakes where I did not focus enough on the big picture that that led to that injury. So uh, I had a race in in April, mid-April, my first half distance race of the season, and uh, and I was training really well for that. And uh, I did take a bit of a risk there in that I stopped going to the gym for a couple of months, I believe, in March and or at least a month and a half in March and half of April until the race, just to I tried to basically train at a maximize my my training volume and and getting a large volume of swimming biking and running and it was a flaw in the program that I was well aware of to not do strength training Uh, although I did do I should say home-based strength training diligently I did three to four times 15-20 minutes per week but I knew that it was still a big risk uh, if I let this sort of training go on for too long I took that risk, which uh, in hindsight is just stupid because my philosophy in triathlon is that we should not balance right on the edge of injury, illness, or overtraining. We should not take too many like risks. Uh, it makes no sense. We want to avoid risks and, and be consistent, and that's how we're going to get the most improvement. Uh, so uh, Because we are already in the realm, well into the realm of diminishing returns when we are even aware of the fact that we are taking risks. Uh, So put another way, the Pareto principle again, you can get 80% of your training benefits for 20% of the risk. So what I should have done is to do a little less swimming or biking or running, if that's what was required for me to fit in that gym-based strength training that uh, I knew would help keep me healthy and keep me injury-free. Uh, However, what ended up happening was that I I got so great improvements in my swimming and biking and running in the short term that I got a bit greedy. And even after that first race, I continued to follow the same sort of training structure. So I did not uh, jump off of that, uh, I guess, personal bandwagon that I have uh, had at the moment. And I kept doing the same thing and and hoped that I would see even more improvements. And uh, that was my mistake number one. I focused too much on the potential short-term gains and I did not look at the big picture and the risk profile of my training structure that I had. So so what ended up happening was that I was out on a glorious Sunday morning on a long run watching the sunrise over the hills in the Algarve. Life was good and then I felt my hamstrings starting to cramp up a little bit. And this is where I made mistake number two because it was just a tiny little cramp in the hamstring. Uh, but I should have just stopped, either walked back, I think it was eight kilometers away at that point, or just wait and hitch a ride, uh, which I ended up doing ultimately. I justified keeping running by saying that I'm already eight kilometers away. I, I don't want to walk back. I might as well continue. There were no cars out at that time, really, or I had to wait a long time to see any cars. Thinking back, yeah, I'm not quite sure how I tricked myself into believing that that's a good justification that I might as well continue. Uh, But I did learn my lesson. Two or three kilometers later, I got a complete hamstring strain. That cramp turned into uh, a sudden strain and 
I could not walk, so I had to wait 30 minutes or so to hitch a ride back. And this was late April, so after that first race, and I had to do my second race of the season with uh, no or very limited run training uh, for the three weeks leading into it. And only now, early July, as I record this episode, am I getting to a point where I'm completely rid of the injury again. And I actually just did my my first run with any intensity uh, that I have done since the injury yesterday on the 1st of July. So unnecessarily, I lost something like eight, eight weeks of normal run training because of mistakes i made that all stemmed from not looking at the big picture i took too much risk by eliminating strength or eliminating gym-based strength training and thinking that the volume of running and cycling and swimming would make me fitter in the short term which it maybe did but it cost me in the long term and uh, and the other mistake is that in that single workout Uh, I did not stop and listen to my body and uh, avoided the risk by walking back home or waiting to hitch a ride back home. I kept running even though I felt the early warning signs of an injury coming on and uh, that ended up costing me. And this is one of the main reasons that having a coach is so important for anybody. Uh, I am self-coached but personally and and I am of course working as a coach full time but I am actually going to to start with a coach again in October I think I maybe mentioned that in another episode because I I don't think it's ideal for anybody coach or not to not have a coach uh, it's just impossible to be objective about your own training this is an honest and transparent example of how I really failed to be that and we all think that we're not at risk of these things that happen uh, we think that they happen to others but not ourselves but uh, that's just not the case. So to sum up, in your training, you will many times be at a crossroads when you have to make a risk assessment and estimate the risk-benefit ratio of a training decision. And uh, I want you to be aware that the tendency for all of us is extreme overestimation of the benefit side and extreme underestimation of the risk side. Use this knowledge to your advantage and try to not make these mistakes. Uh, Strive for low risk training, And uh, that will mean a low risk for injury, illness, overtraining, and lack of motivation and other inconsistencies. And uh, you will use that Pareto principle so that your risk profile is as low as 20% and you can still get 80% of the training benefits. And in the long run, you will then get far more improvements than those who have a higher uh, risk profile in their training and may make slightly more short-term improvements but far less long-term improvements because of periods of inconsistency the way that i've experienced now on the run side of thing things a period of inconsistency one final thing though on the flip side of the coin let's say that you for example travel for work or something else that on the surface will lead to inconsistency like a forced week of no training because of a super busy schedule if you take the focus on the big picture approach and apply it to that situation what you end up doing is you somehow figure out a way to get even 20 minutes of exercise done every day. It might be running, it might be bodyweight strength training, it might be working with swim, bands, stretch cords. But those 20 minutes per day, it may seem like nothing, especially if you're obsessing about training stress score or things like that. It will look like nothing. But those 20 minutes per day will add up and limit the detraining that could otherwise happen. So uh, it's worth a lot from the big picture perspective. All right, number six is uh, the engine, the chassis, and the theory of constraints. And uh, I'm actually not really a big motorsports fan, but I think that motorsports is a great analogy for making this point. So uh, a Formula One car has a V6 engine that produces up to 800 horsepower, and they need to withstand lateral forces of up to 4 or 5 G. By the way, I did not know this. I looked this up. Uh, Put the same engine the same formula one engine in pretty much any other car and on that same formula one circuit with all the turns and things going on on that uh, circuit or put an even bigger engine like the formula one engines that they used to have a few years ago that were up to 1000 horsepower v10 engines and uh, that car that other car that is not a formula one car will still lose by a landslide to a formula one car if they even complete the circus that is because the chassis of those other cars aren't built to handle that amount of lateral force, that those lateral uh, G-forces that I just mentioned. As an example, a NASCAR car, they have uh, motors that are similar in horsepower, I believe. 
but they have to withstand lateral forces of only 2g their circuits are, are much different they are oval and don't have the amount of turns that the, for, the formula one circuits have so that nascar car actually would do pretty okay on a formula one course with a formula one engine but it would still need to corner a bit more carefully so it would not get the full potential out of that formula one engine uh, even though they can get quite a lot of that out of of that engine power because they're built to withstand at least 2g even if it's not 4 or 5g on the other hand a family station wagon with a formula one engine on a formula one circuit would not be able to do anywhere near as well because the chassis just is not built for those types of forces so so you it would only get a a fraction of the potential of the engine out on that circuit just because the chassis isn't built to to handle that uh, that sort of stress this brings us to triathlon you can have the best engine in the world but if your chassis isn't up to scratch then you might only be able to use a fraction of your potential uh, of your engine the vice versa is also true of course but this is rarely an issue for triathletes and the exception here would be people that are just coming into triathlon from something like a strength training background or a team sports background uh, so uh, so in this uh, point i'm mostly going to assume that your your chassis is limiting you more than your uh, than your engine because that's true for 90 percent of triathletes if you want to get the most out of your training and your triathlon performance at the end of the day you have to make sure that your chassis is uh, at more or less the same level as your engine this means you have to do mobility you have to do strength training and this includes lifting weights but also core stability and core strength uh, working on counter rotation and doing plyometrics you probably should also do regular body work in the form of massage therapy uh, maybe doing some foam rolling and especially if you're training a fair amount then this sort of body work is super important and you have to regularly assess your chassis by letting an expert mechanic uh, by that i mean a physical therapist have a look at it and if there are weaknesses in your chassis these weaknesses need to be addressed. That's why you need to go and see that, that mechanic. So if we return to my example of the hamstring strain that I got, and uh, being, being away from proper run training for eight weeks or so, that actually caused some good things to happen because it made me return to really take proper care of all of these things. So I went back to get regular massages. I started going to the gym twice per week and lifting weights and doing plyometrics and keeping up with my core based strength training and counter rotation training that I had been doing at home already and and also keeping my mobility up to speed so the result of this is that now that I'm getting back to soon resume normal run training uh, even though my run engine has uh, decreased in strength a lot I'm actually not performance wise uh, I'm, I'm actually not far off where I were and uh, I noticed this yesterday in the hard run that I did that my chassis is so much stronger and better prepared to handle that running than it was that uh, that actually the net loss of performance is quite small despite eight weeks of very limited run training um, my engine and chassis were just way out of balance and it makes me wonder how quickly i can run if i can get my engine back to the same level it was and keep strengthening and working on the chassis it remains to be seen but i'm quite excited about that as i've seen now in in both the easy runs earlier on and the hard run yesterday that actually the net loss of fitness hasn't been that big or net loss of performance i should say so for you what this means my recommendation is to be aware that in all three disciplines you are only as strong as your weakest link in the chain and if your weakest link in the chain is the chassis then you can do all the work in the world on the engine you can be capable of producing a ton of energy in a short period of time uh, i.e a ton of power but you are going to be bleeding energy and not translating that energy produced into performance if your chassis is weak just like that station wagon with a formula one engine on a formula one circuit so identify where your chassis is in relation to your engine and work to bring them into balance and do this in all three disciplines the disciplines are strongly overlapping uh, lapping i should say but uh, there are some things that you will need to consider separately for each discipline so for example plyometrics is not needed for swimming or cycling but if you want to make the most out of your running you cannot not do plyometrics all right point number seven is to get out of your comfort zone but not just by going harder 
but by doing things that are new and that you aren't that good at. So we often end up doing the things that we are good at or we are comfortable with over and over again because it gives us a false sense of security and confidence that things are going well. To some extent, it may even be true, like work on your strengths. There is some truth to that, but equally, there's often a lot of low-hanging fruit by starting to do things that are outside of your comfort zone and that you're not good at. So one example here that immediately comes to mind is strength and conditioning from that previous point. And it's actually probably one of the most common ones that that is low-hanging fruit for a lot of triathletes. But to give some other examples, another very common one is transition practice. Could you get a minute of free speed in your next race if you just spent a little time practicing your transitions? I would say that for the vast majority of age group athletes, the answer is a resounding yes. Uh, Two examples uh, from my personal training that I'm working on right now would be uh, one on swimming. I'm working a lot on my left-sided breathing. Uh, So it's actually funny because my left-sided breathing isn't really much slower, if any slower, than my right-sided breathing. But I just don't feel as comfortable breathing to the left, which causes me to almost always breathe to the right or breathe bilaterally, which I do all the time in training when the intensity isn't high, I I breathe bilaterally and that feels completely comfortable to me. But breathing every two strokes or every four strokes to the left, that feels way more uncomfortable than breathing every two or every four strokes to the right. And that's something that I'm working on to correct to so that in races I have the flexibility of breathing, for example, every two strokes to the left and still feel that I'm going as fast as I go if I breathe every two strokes to the right. So that will definitely help me in my race performance. Uh, The second point that I want to mention here as a personal example is uh, that now I do all my hard bike workouts also on the indoor trainer in the time trial position. And this may seem like kind of a well duh thing, but the truth is that uh, Whenever the intensity for of a workout, a bike workout for me has been at threshold or higher and I've been on the indoor trainer, then I've not only been more comfortable doing that hard work sitting up and not being down in the TT position, but I've also been producing significantly higher power numbers. So for a while, it was not just a, a comfort thing, but it was also a confidence and ego thing. And uh, that's just super dangerous. And uh, I'm glad that I caught myself at some point. Uh, when I was thinking back on, on the training block and uh, and the race that followed that training block, and I thought that one of the few pieces of low-hanging fruit that I have left for improvements is probably to get super diligent of doing all of my training, even the hard training on the indoor trainer in the TT position. So I started doing that, and it was really horrible at first. I mean, really horrible. My power was so much lower, and even then I couldn't do an entire main set, an entire hard main set in the TT position. I was good at submaximal, or sort of good at submaximal efforts, but but not when it was when we were talking about harder sets. And it still is definitely a work in progress for me. I'm still closing that gap. I'm still way outside of my comfort zone when I'm in the TT position in a hard set. But it's clear from my training that uh, I was right, that this has been a piece of low-hanging fruit and it's improving quickly and it will greatly help my triathlon performance in my next races, I'm sure. So to sum up, think about whether you have things that you are avoiding, even though it might not be active avoidance or conscious avoidance, it might be just subconscious avoidance, and then assess why you think you are avoiding it. Is it just because it's outside of your comfort zone? Does it have the potential to improve your triathlon performance? And is it low-hanging fruit? And if it is low-hanging fruit and you're avoiding it just because it's a bit outside of your comfort zone, time to forget about that and uh, go ahead and go after it. Point number eight, use group training strategically. Group training can be a really great way to move the needle for you in training and get more out of a single session than you would on your own. So to give an example here, a hard uh, criterion style ride can be a great fitness builder because you work at a very hard intensity, probably harder than you could in a solo session, but it still doesn't feel harder than a solo session because motivation is just higher when you're in a group in a race simulation session. But you also get a lot of other benefits from that session than just a pure fitness aspect. And that would be things like bike handling, tactical awareness and concentration and focus. 
And if you're training for draft legal racing, then race specificity, of course. The main benefit of group training, the way I see it, is that it can allow you to break through self-imposed barriers that you didn't even know that you that you had. So if we go back to that 10 by 400 meter track interval session that, that we talked about before, uh, perhaps you have been doing that solo in 75 seconds as in the example, uh, but then you go out and do that same session with a group and some of the people in the group are running their 400s in 71, 72 seconds. And actually you somehow manage to just about stick with them. And then that is a real breakthrough performance for you. And the same examples are plentiful in swimming and cycling, of course. So if there are things that are that you know are important for your race goals, so this might be the race specificity of crit racing or open water group swim workouts, or if you just feel that you're a bit stuck and you are in the need of a fitness breakthrough, then these are all great reasons to seek out group workouts. However, do not overdo this, and especially not with group workouts that have intensity to them, because there's only so much hard training that you should do, and especially that you should do out slightly outside of your control, so trying to stick to a group of people. If you suddenly start doing three hard group runs per week, for example, you will probably start to go backwards rather quickly and not forwards. And uh, and even two group workouts might be pushing it if those group workouts really have you on the limit. Uh, also, another point to consider is that for longer, steadier endurance work, be aware of the importance of sticking to your own low-intensity training zones and not getting stuck in moderate-intensity training uh, to be with the group. And and I would personally, in most cases, advise against doing your low-intensity workouts with a group. Unless it's a very small group of friends and you know each other very well and you're training very well and you are very evenly matched and, and have the same intended purpose for that uh, endurance-based workout. But in, in most cases, uh, it's just one of those things that we, we tell ourselves ourselves that uh, that we're not really going that hard and that uh, it's well within the realm of where we should be intensity-wise. But, but again, it's difficult to be objective about our own training. So uh, when you look back at the workout, perhaps you are right that the average power and average heart rate of that long ride was right on point. But, uh, but when you look into the details, every time you, you got to even the slightest hill, the power and the heart rate spiked. So it really wasn't that steady endurance workout that you were looking for. So use group training. It can be really great. Many believe that the great secret to Kenyan and Ethiopian distance running success is not in altitude and not in genetics, but in their group training culture. And there probably is a lot of truth to that. But equally, there are probably hundreds of of runners, casualties of that running culture that just haven't been able to run with the group and handle that group training as well. So we never hear of this. Of course, so use group training smartly when you need it and uh, not where it has the potential to only increase your risk for no additional reward. Number nine, benefit from the compound effect of coaching, testing, technical advice and bike fits and so on. This one is pretty easy and you've heard me talk about this many times before. The analogy here is uh, the compound effect of saving for retirement the earlier you start investing or saving, the more that money will grow through the compound effect and the more returns you'll get for free, so to say. And the exact same thing is true in triathlon when it comes to, to coaching, testing, getting technical advice and uh, bike fits and so on. All of these things that uh, you can lump under, I guess, services to some extent. So let's take an example, a triathlete that is going to be in the sport for five years. If this athlete is only going to have a coach for one year of their five-year career and they're only going to go into the lab twice to get accurate uh, training zones tested uh, in the lab and they're only going to get three swim video analyses done then what would be the best time to do all of this for coaching it's year one for the lab tests i would say beginning of year one and beginning of year two and for the swim video analysis, I would say every four months during year one. So three of them, that would be month zero, month four, and month eight. Because the reason for this is that this athlete will gain so much information from all of this and improve so much during that first year that not only will they start year two from a much better baseline than if they wait to get all of those services until, let's say, year three, uh, but they will 
not only have that better baseline, that better starting point for year two, but they will already have learned all of those things that they need to learn about training through the having a coach. They will have learned a lot about their swimming technique and improving their swimming technique through the video analysis. They will have learned to understand their training zones and training intensities through the testing. So the next years, the years two through four will be so much more effective than if they hadn't done all of those things early on. So to bring it back to the compound effect, this athlete keeps getting rewarded for those year one investments for the remaining four years of the triathlon career. And compare this to somebody who does all of these things exactly the same way, but in year three rather than year one. They will have a great year three, no doubt, learn a ton and also get a ton of improvements. But they will only get two years of that compound effect where they can really use all of those things that they learn. And the first first two years, they will have done some things right, probably improved quite a bit, but they will have done some things very wrong as well. So their baseline at the start of year three is way behind the person who did this already in year one. So the point here is to do as many of these investments as you can sooner rather than later, and you will be rewarded for it with more effective training for many years to come, come, even if you completely stop investing in these things, just like uh, is the case with investing uh, money and saving for retirement. And this, uh, I should say personally, is something that I've got 100% right since getting into triathlon, probably because I did it so wrong before triathlon when I was just running. But when I got into triathlon, I was very intentional about this, about getting a coach early on, getting a ton of one-on-one swimming lessons and video analysis, uh, getting testing done, getting a bike fit, going to training camps and so on. And I would not be near the training level that I am at today without those investments and that compound effect of those investments early on. And finally, we have number 10, which is to review your training and racing. This is really a key component of figuring out how you can improve your training and racing and make it even more effective. You don't need to spend a lot of time doing this. And in particular, don't overanalyze every single workout. There's absolutely no point in doing that. But it is a common trap that many athletes fall into. However, I think that you should always write something down about each workout in your training log because that helps you actively reflect on the training that you did and it gives you more clarity in whether there are things that you can improve or not. It doesn't have to be a long comment or a long log. A few sentences is often enough. But to give you an idea, the things that that I would always ask myself and that I recommend that most athletes should ask themselves when reviewing your workout uh, are how did I feel during the workout? Did I feel normal, better than normal or worse than normal? What was the session RPE of the workout on that scale of 1 to 10, as we already talked about? What was the purpose of the workout and did I follow through on it and execute it according to the intended purpose? And this is where you may want to look at your heart rate, power and pace data without overanalyzing it and uh, and use that information that you you gain to to answer whether you whether you followed the intended purpose or not. But also consider how you the answer to the first two questions how you felt and what the session rpe was because those also impact on whether you follow the intended purpose of the workout the next question that i would ask is what went well and why so for example let's say i swam slightly faster than normal for the same rpe perhaps because i started to do a pre-swim mobility routine so i should probably keep keep up keep doing it and the next question is what did not go well and why for example here we'll keep doing that swimming example i still fade quite a bit in the later intervals of this workout even though it feels that i'm going just as hard i think i let my stroke rate drop without noticing it next question is is there anything i should do differently and anything i should keep doing the same for my next workout in this swimming workout example we could say I should try to swim this workout with the Finis tempo trainer in stroke rate mode so I don't drop my stroke rate later on. I should also try to have a sports drink rather than just water as maybe my fading later in the workout is due to my energy stores running low. I should keep doing the pre-swim mobility as I saw a performance improvement doing that today. There are, of course, many other things that you could ask yourself, but these key questions will go a long way. And importantly, they are quite actionable because you ask yourself what you might want to change or what you should keep doing. So you take an active decision and an active part in your training process. 
So doing a quick workout review like this is another way to cause a compound effect, just like in the previous po point, because in this swim workout example, for example, the pre-swim mobility routine is something that this swimmer uh, noticed had a positive impact. And from now on, it can have a positive impact on every single swim, which will then, of course, over time, have a big knock-on effect of their, on their overall swim performance improvements. So that's about it. Those are the 10 points. And just to review them quickly once again, have a purpose and know the purpose of each workout. Go into each workout with the right mindset. Know the prerequisites of successful workouts. Use session RPE to train at the right intensity. Focus on the big picture. Have a balance between your engine and your chassis. Get out of your comfort zone, but not just by going harder. Use group training strategically. Benefit from the compound effect of coaching, testing, technical advice, bike fits, etc. And finally, review your workouts and your races effectively. I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. It uh, was uh, really, really fun for me to put together because these are the things that I really see move the needle for my athletes a lot of times. And I've uh, seen seen them move the needle for me as well in my own training. So definitely this is one that, uh, that I would probably listen to a couple of times if I, if I were you and, and really engage in some self-reflection on how you can use this information to make your training better and improve your triathlon performance as a result as usual you can find the show notes on that triathlonshow.com and as usual remember to subscribe to the podcast if you are not already subscribed i interview shannon grady next monday and that is really a doozy of an episode we talk about lactate dynamics and how it can guide training principles and we go much much deeper than we've done before Actually, we go much, much deeper than I thought was possible because Shannon is uh, a world-leading expert in this topic. We talk about common training mistakes. So we take things from technical and from science to practice. Shannon is also a former professional runner and, uh, and does triathlon as well. But uh, on the professional levels, running was her main sport. So she has a ton of knowledge in the practical sense as well. And uh, she is a coach, by the way. So she's a fantastic guest to have to talk about common training mistakes and also recovery and nutrition mistakes. And these all tie into that scientific background or that lactate dynamics. So uh, this leads into talking about a systems-based training approach and how many athletes actually are not able to access several of these training systems or energy systems because of training and nutrition mistakes and how that is greatly limiting their performance. So it is a fascinating episode. You can probably hear that I am super excited about it. So stay subscribed and you won't miss that. Of course, in the meantime, there will be those uh, Q&As coming out every Thursday. So keep sending in questions for that as well. Finally, remember to check out scientifictriathlon.com. If you haven't, you can see uh, what uh, products and services we offer there in terms of training plans, coaching, testing, etc. So scientifictriathlon.com will worth a visit. And uh, to end off, big thanks to our sponsors, as usual, Roka, that you can find on roka.com. You can get uh, your entire order, whether it's wetsuits, tri suits, high performance eyewear, for 20% off with the promo code TTS, all caps. And thank you to Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. And you can get your first box or tube of electrolyte for free with the promo code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart, keep loving triathlon.